There was a patient that I saw a week ago, about 77-year-old gentleman who has been living with polycythemia vera for about seven years now. He has been treated properly with hydroxyurea because he's, uh, by default, being older than 60, a gentleman with a high risk for thrombosis. And hydroxyurea was very well tolerated. He had no problems with taking it for all these years until recently. His blood cell count was controlled well, no symptoms at all. But now he presented to me for a second opinion because over the last six months he developed ulcers on the leg, around the ankle on the right leg. Now, that was not recognized, unfortunately, over the last six months as one of the side effects of hydroxyurea. In fact, I asked him more questions, and he also had the mouth ulcers for quite a long time before that. So there was already what we call mucocutaneous toxicity of hydroxyurea present there. With the dose adjustments, this is unlikely to resolve. One really needs to stop hydroxyurea therapy when you have significant ulcers on the leg for this to go away. And that is the case that is clear-cut in a need of a different therapy than hydroxyurea. It is not wise to continue therapy in a phase of evident toxicity. So replacing therapy in patients who is experiencing toxicity like that or any other types of hydroxyurea related toxicity like a low grade fever, hair loss, diarrhea, low grade fevers, those would be indications for a change of therapy related to toxicity and in this case we actually did suggest a change to ruxolitin. Starting those 10 milligrams twice a day did very well, allowed patients to feel well without any mouth ulcers anymore, his appetite actually increased his fatigue that he also complained of improved, and over the next four months, I would expect that his leg ulcer would heal completely. In uh, clinical studies so far with ruxolitinib in polycythemia vera, we aim to control signs and symptoms of patients with polycythemia vera that are at high risk for thrombosis, previously intolerant or resistant to hydroxyurea. We were assessing the benefit of the therapy in randomized prospective studies comparing ruxolitinib to best available therapy, whatever patient's doctor wanted to do, either continuing hydroxyurea, switching to interferon, or using any other available active therapy. And the benefit of ruxolitinib was multi-leveled. It was in controlling the red blood cell count, in controlling the spleen in one of the two studies where the patients with the spleen were manda mandated, in the other it wasn't mandated, and controlling the symptoms in general from the itching to the low-grade fevers, night sweating, bone aches and pains, or fatigue, and allowing patients to fully recover to their pre-therapy activity levels and enjoy life fully. You would expect that in majority of the patients, in all these aspects, and one we need to understand that we are treating a person, not just the red blood cell count. HU intolerance is seen in about 10 to 12 percent of the patients. It is manifested most of the time by the ulcers on the leg or in the mouth. One cannot avoid stopping the therapy because for full healing of the leg ulcer in particular, one needs to stop this therapy to allow full healing. Otherwise, you have chronic ulcerations on the leg and it obviously predisposes patients to further complications, not just infectious complications, but circulatory complications and decreases the ability to walk in many patients. To discontinue hydroxyurea therapy, there must be a good reason. And it's not only about inability to control the red blood cell count. In fact, one needs to understand that the control of the red blood cell count with hydroxyurea really means to control the hematocrit below 45% without the use of phlebotomy. The goal of cytoreductive therapy in general, once you start it, is to eliminate need for phlebotomy and have hematocrit below 45% all the time. If that is not possible, then one should consider alternative therapy, like ruxolitinib. Also, elevation in white cell count, particularly progressive leukocytosis, or progressive increase in the platelets, as well as progressive loss of quality of life, or progressive splenomegaly. These are additional four factors that would indicate a loss of a control of the disease with hydroxyurea and require a change in the therapy, and now we have ruxolitinib approved for that indication. For polycythemia vera, 
after hydroxyurea, ruxolitin is indicated to end the starting doses 10 mg twice a day. Everybody starts at 10 mg twice a day. First three months are the most important parts where the dose adjustments may be needed. And we know from the two large prospective studies that about 70% of the patients may indeed need a different dose than 10 mg twice a day. About 60% of the patients will need more, meaning 15 mg twice a day, 20 mg twice a day, or even 25 mg twice a day, which is the maximum dose. Or you may need to decrease, and about 10 mg twice a day can be lowered to 5 mg twice a day in about 10% of the patients. Long-term tolerability of ruxolitinib in polycetima vera is very well documented. We have experience from the phase two study where patients have been on therapy for many years. There is uh, hardly any patient that stopped the therapy because of a lo loss of response. In fact, that is very unusual event. And now we have uh, long-term results from the prospective randomized study called the response study where patients were randomized between ruxolitinib and best available therapy, where ruxolitinib has markedly outperformed the best available therapy, led to approval of ruxolitinib for polycythemia vera, and a long-term follow-up says clearly that if you have a good response, it's gonna last. Hardly anybody loses the response.